Shalom Aleichem, and welcome back, everyone. As we are now a full week after Hag HaShavuot, a full week after Kabbalat Torah, and now we are holding in Parshat Naso. So we in Chutzlar, it's on Parshat Naso this week. And let's take a look at some of the lessons that we can learn from this parasha. Uh, we're going to skip to or towards the, uh, right before Hamishi, which talks about the Birkat Kohanim. Right, so we have a uh, we have a mitzvah that every day for us Faradim we still do this, even Chutz Laaretz. That every single day Kohanim give a bracha to the Jewish people. Right in the Shaharit we do this. The Kohanim get up. Now this is not part of the lessons of the day, but I just want to mention it because I see a lot of people stumble in this when the Kohanim are giving the bracha. Everybody has to be facing the Kohen. So even if you're the father, the grandfather, and there's 10 people that want to get underneath this talit, everyone can get underneath this talit, but everybody still has to be facing the Kohen. You should not be facing the grandfather, or the father, the guy who's holding the talit, or you shouldn't be facing each other and talking. Everyone should be facing towards the Kohen, because it has to be the Kohen's giving the bracha to the Jewish people. That's something just to pay attention to. Now in, in the brachot, of what the Kohanim tell us, the first bracha is three words. You have the first, there's three brachot. Three, five, and seven. Right, easy to remember. The first one is three words. Second one is five words. And the third verse has seven words. How do you remember it? Three is how many people go up to the Torah on a weekday. Five hundred people go up to the Torah on a holiday. And seven hundred people go up to the Torah on a Shabbat. So it's a way to remember, and there's, there's associations between each pasuk and the weekday Shabbat and the, on the holidays. But we're not going to get into that. What we are going to get into is the first pasuk, it says, Yivarecha Hashem ve'yishmerecha. So translate this, means, Yivarecha Hashem should bless you. Yivarecha Hashem, Hashem should bless you. Ve'yishmerecha. And He should guard you. So what does this mean? Why, if I give a blessing to give me bracha? Why do I need to be guarded as well? Why do I need protection to the bracha? To leave you. Oh, is it very good? <laughs> so there's a, there's a story we've shared in the past. And the story goes, there was a couple, a young couple, not a young couple actually, an older couple, and they were retiring age. They're at retirement. And uh, after all the money they collected, they were only able to afford to go on a five-day cruise to the Mediterranean. And they went on the cruise... And uh, they stopped off at an island in one of the Greek islands, uh, Santorini. And they're at Santorini. And they were walking into one of the local shops. And the wife went into the shop and she's looking around. She finds a lamp. And she calls her husband and says, Husband, look, I found a lamp. Maybe there's something that looks nice. It looks gold. So she says, let's see what it really looks like. So she takes out you know, her cloth and she starts to rub the lamp to clean it up. To see what it looks like, it's it worth to buy it or not. Ah, oh, so very good. Yosef says, the genie comes out of the lamp. All right, the genie comes out of the lamp. And the genie says, I see you guys have been together for a very long time. Usually, my policy is one wish. Every time I come out of the lamp is one wish. But since you guys are so much loving each other, I'll give you both a wish. I'll give you a wish and I'll give you a wish. Extra. Buy one, get one free. So the wife immediately says, Oh, if I had one wish, I wish to be on a proper ocean cruise. I want to be on a cruise for not just one week, two, three weeks, and I want the best food and the best views and everything. Not some cheap five-day cruise. And in an instant, poof, she was gone, and the genie put her on a cruise. And now he turns to the husband, and he says to the husband, And what would you like? He looks around, he sees his wife's not there, and he says, I have one wish. I would like a wife that is 30 years younger than me. And Jeannie says, no problem. He clicks his fingers and makes him 30 years older, right? <laughs> if he's 30 years older, now she is 30 years younger than him. You see, there's a bracha, is a blessing that you can get. But then the question is, how do you get that blessing? Unfortunately, there were people who were successful 
They made good money. And then they bought themselves a fancy car. And then what happened? They got into an accident. They went somewhere they should have gone. They went somewhere on some sort of vacation and they came back. They didn't come back, right? Because suddenly their blessing, their money, led them down the wrong road. And sometimes that's what happens. So says in our Pasuk, says the Bray, the Kohanim, bless us. Hashem says, bless the Jewish people that what? Hashem should bless you and protect you and guard you. The blessing shouldn't take away. Uh, however, anyone ever re read the, uh, there's many such stories like this, but there's one short story called the monkey's paw, right? The monkey's paw is like this talisman, this good luck charm that if you touch it and you say a wish, it comes true. But every time the wish comes true, something else bad happens to you or to your family or to your loved one. And that's what happens a lot of times. But we don't do that. We get bracha. We ask Hashem to give us a bracha fully. Fully protected. Right? And fully insured. With no problems. There's a, the Hazal tell us. There was a great tzaddik. Rav Yossi ben Kisma. He was very, very, very wealthy. He had a lot of money. Hashem blessed him with the blessing of a lot of money. And what happened was. People knew about his money. And they kidnapped two of his sons. And they took them to Rome. They wanted a ransom. They wanted money. So Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma understood the kidnappers wanted a ransom. He took a hundred gold dinner coins and he brought it to the head kidnapper. He went to Rome and he brought it to the head kidnapper and he put it on his table. A hundred gold coins. And the kidnapper looks at him and says to him, if you think that I'm going to release your children because of these Cheap, a hundred coins, he can forget about it. And he laughed him out of the room. And as he leaves, Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma, Davin Sa'akadosh Baruch Hu. And Hashem listens to Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma, and what does he do? He gives this captor, the guy who kidnapped Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma's two sons, intense stomach pains. No one should ever know of such pains. But he had such stomach pains. He didn't know what to do. Right? So he asked his advisors, and his advisors said, maybe it's because you disrespected the rabbi. You know, he's a holy rabbi, he came in, and you, you laughed him out of the room. So he says, call him back. He calls the Yosef and Kisla back, and he tells him, I'll take your offer, a hundred gold coins, and I'll give you back your two sons. And Yosef and Kisla says, what? He says, that was the old deal. <laughs> that was the old deal. I have a new deal for you. Now it's for 80 coins. This man says, what? I already went down to 100, now you want 80? Get out of here. And he kicks Yosemite Kisma out of the room again. As soon as Yosemite Kisma leaves the room, what happens? Pain His pain it. intensifies and increases. He calls him back in. He says, come back, I'll take your 80. And what does Yosemite Kisma say? We'll do 50. <laughs> he says, what 50? And he throws him out again. He throws him out. And what happens? Again, the guy's pain, he's... he's uncontrollable pain. <clears throat> he calls him back. And he says, okay, I'll take the 50. At this point, Yossi Ben Kisma says, actually, you'll give them back to me for free. He says, get out of here. I didn't steal them. I didn't kidnap them to get them back for free. Get out. As soon as he leaves, again, the pain intensifies. He calls back Yossi Ben Kisma. He says, take your two sons. And Yossi Ben Kisma says, not so simple. Now you have to pay me to take them back. Wow. And that's what happened. He ended up paying Yosef and Kisma to take back his two sons. True story. But what are we seeing? Yosef and Kisma, his blessing of Shefa, of wealth, was protected. Because you can have the wealth, you can have it. But if it's not protected, a lot of bad things can happen. A lot of wrong people can end up with it. A lot of people can come after it. So Kadush Baruch Hu blesses the Jewish people. Hashem. The blessings you should get should be protected. Another lesson on this Birkat Kohanim. Towards the end of Birkat Kohanim, we say, Yisa Hashem panav elecha, veyasem lecha shalom. Hashem should place shalom on you. What does it mean, shalom? Veyasem lecha shalom says the Midrash Rabbah. There are three types of shalom. Vayasem lecha shalom. Shalom b'chnisatcha. Shalom when you enter a place. Shalom b'tzetacha. A peace when you come out of a place. Shalom im kol adam. 
and peace with every person. What does this mean? Says the Kitab Sofer. You know what shalom and, and, and your arrival means? That means shalom by it. A person should have shalom by it. So one of the brachot that we get, by Yisim Lecha Shalom, is that you should have shalom by it. Says the Kitab Sofer. What does it mean? Shalom when you go out. This is shalom with people in your surroundings. And shalom, the last one that we said with every person, this is all of mankind should find, you should find peace with them. Now, <clears throat> there was a Rebetzin by the name of Ruchama Shane. And uh, she lived in an apartment building and she went under, underwent knee surgery. And the day she was being discharged from the hospital, she and her husband, her husband was Rabbi Shane, obviously, and he was claustrophobic, meaning he was very hard to stay in small spaces. He would get very, very fearful, very nervous, very quick. And they were coming back from the hospital and they entered their apartment building. And you know where these apartment buildings have very small elevators. So they went to the small elevator. And instead of the elevator going up, as soon as they went in and there were two other people there, as soon as they went in, the elevator dropped and went straight to the basement and stopped moving. And it was there for an hour, if not more. And she just had knee surgery. And he was very claustrophobic. And yet the whole time, they both kept quiet and didn't make a scene. And when finally the elevator doors opened and the neighbors prepared some fruits and drinks for them when they came out, the rabbit's turns to her husband. He says, I know that you can't stand and small places, you have so much fear, you're so claustrophobic, how did you manage? And he says, I'll tell you the truth, it wasn't easy. But the whole time, the whole time that I was standing there, I didn't even think about my claustrophobia. I didn't think about being in small places, you know why? I was worried about your knees, you just had knee surgery. I was wondering how my Rebbeton standing on her knees is in so much pain. But he says to her, I don't understand you. How did you just stand there for a whole hour? You just had knee surgery and your knees hurt. How could you stand there for a whole hour? And she says, the truth is, I didn't even feel my knees because the whole time I was worried about you. How are you, the rabbi, able to stand there in the claustrophobia? You see, this is called Shalom Bayit. When each one is worried about the other. You know, it's interesting, Chazal tell us that at Matan Torah that we just had, on Shavuot, the Jewish people were crying. Why were they crying? Because until the Torah was given, you were allowed to marry close relatives. Krovim, you're allowed to marry close relatives. And now the Torah came, and the Torah said you cannot marry close relatives. And what happened? They started to cry. Why did they start to cry? Hazal tell us. They said to, to love our close relatives, this we can do. It's easy to love our close relatives. Right? You still have today certain groups of people marry their cousin and everybody's marrying their cousin. But they're talking about even closer than that. Closer than cousins. And they said now it's going to marry someone from the outside. It's going to be hard to, 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 to love them. It's easy to, marry, to love your own than to love someone from the outside and bring them in. So why did Hashem do this? Why did Hashem want them to marry, so to speak, people outside, outside the family? So it says here in Eit HaChaim, Saif Kol Saif, Hashem made it this way. You know why? Because, yeah, you love your family. You know, regardless what they do, you're still going to love them. But to love someone else, you have to build it. You have to grow it. And Hashem wants us to grow our love. You know, the Rambam says in Pekei Avot, there are three types of love. The first type of love is the most immature of loves. Which one is that? A love of a thing. I love this person because he has money. I love that person because she's beautiful. I love this because they have this. Right? That's a love of toilet that's based on... Uh, wait, based on something. It's based on something that the person has. And that's the most immature of loves. Then you have what he, the Rambam calls a ohev menucha. Which means... This is a step up. This means I love people that are like me. People who are similar to me, I'm able to spend a good time with them because we are similar. But then the Rambam says is the highest love and that's the love 
of a total merging of feeling that you not just love that person, but rather you become one with that person. You know, the Zohar says that the Shechina is only found in a place of Ahdut, the place where there is unity. And where is that supposed to be? In the house, says the Gemara. If a man and a woman are Zohar, the Shechina is with them. Why? Because the closest you can become to someone is your wife. When a person feels for his wife, like the famous story of Rabbi Ari Levin, Rabbi Ari Levin would go to the hospital, to the doctor, with his wife's foot pain, he didn't say, my wife's foot is hurting. What did he say? Our foot is hurting. You know, it's a different feeling. This is, how do you know if we've reached this level of Shalom Bayant? It's very simple. It says over here in the Etzahayim, if you feel that you're doing a favor for your spouse, then you have not yet reached that level of Shalom Bayit, of Ahdud. Because if you are on a, the highest level, then you're not giving. Who are you giving to? It's you yourself. You're all together. You're not going to feel that you're doing something extra. This is the level we should all be zocher. Ve'yasem lecha shalom. Hashem should place Shalom Bayit upon all of us. And we should work in our levels of Shalom Bayit. I want to end off with one last lesson. And this is the, if you realize, Parshat Naso is one of the longest, if not the longest parashiot in the Torah. It's the longest one, right? It's the longest one. Uh, it comes in with 176 sukim. And what makes it so long is that we have the Nisi'im. We have, right in the beginning, we have the Nisi'im bringing the carbon, and every day they're bringing the same carbon, right? The same carbon. Uh, from Hamishi and on, right? So you have Biyom Hashini, Biyom Rishon, Biyom Hashini, Biyom Hashlishi, Biyom Arvi. So you have 12 tribes, and each one, a Torah spends six psukim telling us what they brought for the korban. Why does the Torah do this? So there are a couple of lessons. I want to focus on two. There was a rabbi by the name of Rav Yitzhak Elchanan. Rav Yitzhak Elchanan, a specter, he was the Kavno Rav. When he was Rav, there was a law in Russia that all young men had to enlist in the army. And if you went to the army, you hardly came back as a, as a religious Jew. It's almost impossible. And the boys in yeshiva, they would apply for exemption. And there was one boy, Yaakov, who applied for exemption, but didn't hear anything. And every day, everyone would try to find out what happened with his exemption. He didn't get it, he didn't get it. One day, it's a Khan inspector. He was sitting together with two Chashiv Rabbanim. And they were dealing in a, in a din, bed din. A case that came to them. And while they were dealing with one of the boys walked in and tells Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khanan, I have great news, I'm so happy to tell the Rebbe, Yaakov got his exemption. And Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khanan thanked the boy so much. They went back with the other Rabbanim and they were talking and again someone walked inside and says, Rebbe, I have to tell you, Yaakov got the exemption. And again, Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khanan got up and thanked the boy, this is amazing news, thank you for telling me. And again, a few minutes later, and again and again, a few times, six, seven times this happened. The other Rabbanim turned to Yitzchak Khan and they say to him, what, what, just tell them you know already. Why do you keep making a whole big deal out of it? So Yitzchak Khan said, what's the reason? He says, each one is coming to tell me. How could I just tell them I know already? They're coming with excitement. They're coming to do something with excitement. They want to do me a favor. We cannot just put it down. The Torah is teaching us about individual attention. It's not just a lesson, but it's a part of the Torah. The Torah says, I could have just said, this is what they brought all of them, this on the first day, this guy on the second day, and that's it, just tell us the 12 names and the six to give and you're done. But the Torah said, no, each and every single one gets its individualized attention. And a lot of times, someone tells you, oh, I, heard, I have this joke to tell you. And they start telling this joke, and what do you say? I heard it already. Or someone starts to the Torah, Oh, and there's a story that goes with it. Ah, I already know it. I already heard it. It's the old news. That's not the way to do it. Hey, the Torah repeats itself over and over and over again. 
Okay, the guy was telling you uh, the joke you already heard. Okay, listen to it again. Laugh again. You hear the story again. Enjoy it again. There's nothing wrong with it. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two from this repetitions. Um, <clears throat> there was a an American rabbi who was invited to South Africa. And they scheduled him to speak in two different places in South Africa on two different days. So he decided you know what he's going to do. He's going to write one good speech. And he's going to say it in both places. So he came to the first place on the first night. And he gave his speech. And it was a phenomenal speech. It really hit the crowd. People were loving it. People came after him. They were talking to him for hours after. And it hit really well. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. A few days later, he is now on the other side of South Africa. And he's about to start his speech. He looks around. It's the exact same crowd. Everybody from the old place came here too. So now he says, I cannot say the same thing. I'm going to say the same thing. They already heard it. So he quickly remembers his Shabbos HaGad Drasha. He remembers his uh, Shabbat Shuvah Drasha. He remembers his other Drashot from out the year. And he, you know, uh, makes a mixtape. He puts everything together. And uh, he gives another, he gives a uh, on-the-spot Drasha. It wasn't as great as his first one. It was okay. And people came over. And they told him, Shkayach, Shkayach, but you know, your, your last time was better. And he says to them, yeah, I know. But I saw you were in the crowd, so I didn't want to say the same speech. So the guys told him, the guys who came, they said, no, we expected you to say the same speech. That's why we came again. We wanted to hear the same speech again. We wanted to hear the fire. We wanted to hear the Debit Torah from the same speech. That's why we did come to hear it. You know, we pray every single day. And we pray the same Tefillah Shemona Esrei again and again and again. Sometimes you think, what are we doing? It's the same thing. It's the same spiel. It's the same story. It's the same game every single day. It's the same tefillah. And what does the Torah tell us? It's not. Every single one is repeated. The exact same words. Why? Because Hashem loves every single one. The same Yom Kippur. The same Sukkot. The same Shavuot. Every single year. People can get, I'm already used to it. I already did it. It's nothing special. No, 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 no. Hashem wants to hear it again. Hashem wants us to do it again. Hashem wants us to put in the same excitement. Hashem wants to put in more excitement. The truth is, if you pray every day, if you pray with Kavanah, you're supposed to pray that every time you understand a new insight into the prayer, you have a new bakasha in the prayer, a new request, something that else fits the words of the prayer. May Kodesh Baruch Hu give us that zechut. So to recap our three lessons from this week's parasha. First we had the lesson of of a blessing that's protected. Not just a blessing, but a blessing that Hashem protects us and keeps our blessings intact and in good condition and fully insured. And then we had the second lesson, Vesem Lecha Shalom. Hashemir Shrabba says means Shalom coming in and the Chitab Sofer says it means Shalom Bayit. And we talked about how to raise ourselves to that level of Shalom Bayit. And our third and final lesson was split into two. The first one is we should give everybody the time of the day and give everybody individualized attention and don't tell them, I already heard it, I already know it. And the second part, B, 3B was that even what we do, repeat, repeating, repeating, repeating what we're saying each and every single time, Kaddish Baruch Hu loves it, listens and waits it. And we too, we should also look forward to it. And don't let it feel like a repetition, but rather let every tefillah, every holiday, every avodah, be unique and specific. Shabbat Shalom. Like